If you're anything like me and you've been asked to officiate a funeral and you don't know where to start, that's where I was several years back. What do I do? What do I say? How do I do this? Well, that's what I'm going to tell you in this video and give you the secret to officiating a funeral. And maybe you're saying, well, I don't need to officiate a funeral. I've just been asked to say something. I'm going to help you out too at the end of the video, so stay tuned. What's up, parishioners? This is Chaplain Reese here, and if God done it for me, He can do it for you too. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you have not already, I want to encourage you to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss the next video where I encourage you to live by faith through Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Ghost. I've been asked to officiate a funeral before. I said, yeah, sure, I would love the opportunity. It would be an honor. When's the funeral? And they say tomorrow. But right here in the Word of God, I'm going to show you where I get my funeral sermon from and how to apply it. Now this funeral sermon is not my own. It's one that I found years and years back when I was flipping through and trying to find a resource. You can always look in a minister's book. There's lots of funeral sermons out there. You don't have to use this, but this is what I use, and it's been very successful. Now, when somebody says, hey, I need you to preach a funeral tomorrow, I don't have to look for this thing, because you see this little clippy right here? It's a little clippy that I keep in the back of my Bible, and I've got important papers clipped, and that's where it stays. This Bible is my workhorse. I take it almost everywhere with me. And that's where I keep my funeral sermon. And we're going to look at that. And if you don't get all this and you want me to send you a detailed picture of this, I will do it. Just send me your email. Let me know. I'd be more than happy to share everything that I've got. But on this, on this, uh, this piece of paper is everything that you need for the funeral. Now, when you get to the funeral home, and you talk to the funeral director, whether it's a week before, whether it's a day before, or whether it's 10 minutes before the funeral, they're going to say, preacher, pastor, chaplain, I need an order of service. And what an order of service is, is basically what it says. It is the way that the funeral service is going to be conducted. Because this funeral director or someone is going to be behind a curtain or in the back, they're going to be controlling the music. And they need to know exactly what's going to happen. So you don't have to sit down with them and scratch your head and say, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know where to put what. You just have to look at this piece of paper and it will tell you exactly what to do. Now, the family members may be sitting down there with you. They may want, want the funeral conducted in a specific way, and that's fine. You may have to do it different. But the funeral director will always give you a copy of the order of service, or they should. You may have to write it down yourself. But let's look at this here. One of the things that may be different and vary in funeral services is the placement of the songs. Some people say, well, I don't know any songs. You can play whatever you want to. You can sing whatever you want to. But most families will pick out songs. Most funerals have three songs that they pick out. And you have to figure out the order of placement of those songs if the family doesn't. And that's what I've got right here on this piece of paper. On this piece of paper, I have song written up top. Usually when everybody's sitting down, when the 10 o'clock service gets started, they will play that song. After that song's over, that's the cue to start the paper. And right here, I know this may sound crazy, but I've got the introduction. And I say, hello, my name is Chaplain Reese. I want to thank you for being here today. Thank you also for your many expressions of love and concern. Now, I don't, I don't look down and read that. I, I glance down and I already know what it says. And my words may vary from what is on this paper. This paper is just a guide. I totally forgot to mention this, but after I tell who I am, I asked everyone if they would bow their head while I open up with a word of prayer. And you could also start with prayer and then do the introduction. After I give my introduction and I tell everybody who I am, I read 
the obituary. The obituary is an important part of the funeral. Now, when you get to the obituary, there's going to be a lot of names on there that you don't know how to pronounce. So beforehand, you need to read the obituary. You need to go to the family member that's sort of in charge of everything and you need to say, hey, how do I pronounce this name? And you may need to write it out a different way than it's spelled on the paper. And then when you're up and you're reading it, if, if you mispronounce the name, you mispronounce it. You just need to go on. You don't need to stay on it a long time. You just need to go through it and go on. Most people will be used to you mispronouncing their name if it's that tough anyway. After the obituary, there is usually the second song. So after I read the obituary, I put it down on the podium where I keep it in my hand and I step back away from the podium so everybody knows that I'm not going to say anything else and a song is playing and it also notifies the funeral director that I'm stepping back, it's time to play the song. After the song is over, I step back up to the podium and then I start my message, my sermon. And it's right here. I'm going to go over it briefly with you. I've got this written down, but like I said, in the past four years, I've preached probably 50 or 50 to 100. I haven't been counting. 50 to 100 funerals. And I've got this down pretty good to where I can, I can casually say it. Uh, because when you, when you preach a, a funeral, you don't need to just get extremely excited and loud. It, it's more of a calm and solemn event. And here's the way I start off. The death of someone is never easy, but gathered here today, we can show our love and concern for each other, and we can share the memories of Miss Harris. And we can look into God's Word for comfort and guidance that we need. And now that Miss Harris is gone, you may be asking yourself, what now? Because there's a, a void, an empty place in your heart where she used to be. But I want to encourage you today to look to God's Word. And I want to talk about four pillars of truth that you can stand on today. Okay, let me stop right there. Now, there are people that I preach funerals for that I have never met before. There are people that I preach funerals for that I've only met one time. There are people that I preach funerals for that I have known for a long time. But during this sermon, this message, you always want to put in stories of that person. People always say, well, this funeral, it, it's not for them. They're dead. It's only for the family. It is for the family, but you're showing honor and remembrance of the person who died. That's basically what the funeral is. So you want to take stories that, that you can relate or stories that the family is told. And a funeral is a very sad time. It's never easy. So if you've got a funny story or a humor, humorous story, then you definitely want to use that because it'll make people laugh and it'll make you feel better and it'll be easier to bring this sermon out. You say, how do you do that? Well, for me, I usually go to the first time that I met the person. I talk about some of their attributes. Like when I would go visit this one lady, I talked at her funeral, and I said it was just like going to Grandma's house. I would walk in, and that screen door would slam behind me, and she would say, you need to go in there and get you some cookies or find something to eat, and everybody just laughed. And then I talked about what I gained from her. And one thing that I remember about that, specific lady is that she lived in a little uh, little uh, humble abode just a little simple house she had her dog and, and she was happy with what she had and you need to relate what you learn from that person some other people uh, if they're grateful if they've got gratitude you need to say that's an attribute that I took and, and I'm not lying about it I'm being truthful talk about the the times and then relate other stories. It's really good to meet with the family and ask them questions and ask them to share stories, write it down, and make notes. So you can bring that out at the first 
or you can intertwine it within this message. The first truth that I always talk about is I say, I want you to stand on the truth that God is good. And it's about Scripture. Scripture comforts people. Scripture touches places that I cannot. So this outline, this sermon has lots of Scripture in it. So I say, I want you to stand on the truth that God is good. And then I quote several scriptures, Psalm 33 and 5. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. God is good. Psalm 34 and 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. God is good. James 1, 17 says, Every good gift and perfect gift is from above. God is good and He sends good gifts. But then there's people that's going to be there and say, well, if this person suffered and died from cancer, where's God good in that? And that's when I say, Chaplain Reese, if God is so good, why is there coronavirus? Why is there death? Why is there destruction? Why is there riots? Why, why is there all this? And I say that we live in a fallen world and each and every individual has a free will to make their own decisions. God has given us that ability. But John 10 and 10 says, The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Even though the devil's bad, even though the world is bad, even though some people are bad, God is still good. The second truth that I want you to stand on is that God loves you. John 3.16, we can all quote it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 5 and 8, But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 4 and 8 simply says that God is love. And then I go into the application. Sometimes when something bad happens in life, we automatically feel like God doesn't love us. But God demonstrated His love toward us. He showed His love by sending His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die and suffer on a cross so that we could be set free from sin and saved. So the next time you feel like God does not love you, Remember the love that was shown in the ultimate sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ. The ultimate illustration of love. Life can be extremely hard, but stand on the truth that God loves you. Now let me stop right there. A funeral is a wonderful opportunity to minister to people who are lost and in sin. But I've heard so many times, and I've been to funerals too, to where the preacher was just talking about hell and, and it just urging people to get saved. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that if you're led of God. But it leaves a bad taste in some people's mouth. I've heard people say, well, hey, you know, that's, that's not right, them just harping on turn from your sins. And it's, it shouldn't be about that. And I understand where people come from with that too. And I believe that it should be about that. It should be about urging people to get saved. But the Bible says that we are to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. So in this message and in my messages, I am telling people that. And I'm letting people know that, but they don't realize it. Does that make sense? And here's the example. These verses that I'm using are verses about salvation. Which leads me to my third point. I want you to stand on the truth that God will help you. Everybody needs help. We can't do this alone. 2 Corinthians 1 and 3 says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies, and the God of all comfort. God wants to comfort you. 1 Peter 5 and 7, we've all heard this. It says, Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. God wants to help you. And one of my favorites that I quote so many times is in Psalm 121, 1 and 2. And it says, I will look unto the hills from whence cometh my help. 
My help cometh from the Lord, maketh heaven and earth. God wants to help you. And I know it's hard when you lose someone, but I want to encourage you today to look to God for help, comfort, and strength. And lastly, God has a plan for your life. And right here is my part where I replace you're going to burn in hell. You're going to die. You don't want to end up a, a sinner that's, that's lost in their sins. I replace it with this part right here that I want you to stand on the truth that God has a plan for your life. I usually look over at the casket and I say the person's name. I might say some of the things that they have accomplished in their life and I say God plan is fulfilled for this life because whether they're a sinner or a saint whatever it, it is God's it's it's done God might not have had his plan but their life is done is what I'm basically trying to say but then I say but you are all still here we're all still alive and we all still have a life to live which means that God is not finished with us and we must go on and another thing that you can slip in there is you can talk about your own life for just a brief time. It's not about us, but you can talk about your own life and how God began to fulfill His plan in your life and you got saved, you got delivered. I've talked about being on drugs and alcohol and stealing in line in funerals and how God saved me and He changed me. and. Here I am preaching this funeral today. And that's a way that you can reach lost people. You can talk to lost people in a funeral without getting down and dirty in, in their face. Does that make sense? Am I okay with that? And then I, ask, uh, I, I talk about that verse. Uh, the Bible says, let, us, let a man examine himself. If you were to examine your life in the past up to this point, what does it look like? Is God pleased with it? Is God fulfilling His plan? And if you were to look in the future, what does your life look like? Are you going to live out God's plan? Because He does have a plan for you. So then I go to my conclusion. The next weeks and months are going to be extremely difficult. The next holidays without Miss Harris. But I want you to always stand on the eternal truth that God is good that God loves you, that God will help you, and that God has a plan for your life. If you're having trouble and you need somebody to talk to, you need somebody to pray with you, you can come to me after the service and I would be more than happy to minister to you in that way. Just let me know. That's what I'm here for. I keep a diagram of the five stages of grief in the back of my Bible also to counsel if anybody... If we could all stand, I'm now going to close in prayer. And then I pray. You, it, it doesn't have to be a long, eloquent prayer. Just pray from your heart. I usually pray that God would comfort these people. I usually pray for God's will. I, I usually pray for peace and strength. And then I say amen. And that's where the last song comes in. A lot of times I take my guitar out and I sing a song, I play Amazing Grace at the end of the funeral, or the funeral director will play a song, you step back, and after the song is over, you can step up back to the podium and say, at this time, I'm going to turn the service back over to Smith Funeral Home or Roller McNutt Funeral Home, and that's when the funeral director comes to the front and says this concludes the service and they start sending people around in front of the casket and then the preacher usually stands by the casket either at the foot or at the head I've, I've stood at both I don't know which one is proper and it's coronavirus so you may do it different now but I usually shook hands hug people's neck whatever they needed at that time now you may have been asked to preach the graveside service too. Graveside services are usually relatively short and to the point 
and during this time at a graveside service usually what I would do that is, is tell a Bible story read Psalm 23 play a song on the guitar and have a word of prayer that that's it you can read a poem like footsteps in the sand sometimes I play two or three songs on the guitar it's whatever the family wants for, for that. And I'll, I'll mention this now, I forgot to mention it before, but sometimes during the funeral, the family may have someone else that they would like to speak. And you let them come up and speak before you give your sermon. You call their name and they come up and you step back and they say what they want to. There may be people that sing songs that the family wants to sing. That's fine. And sometimes you can open up the floor and say, is there anyone here that wants to, to say something? Somebody in the congregation will stand up and they'll tell a story. You've got to be careful with this because I've asked the family if I could do this one time. They said yes and someone stood up and said some things that probably should not have been said. I was like, oh, shouldn't have done that. So you got to be careful about that. And the same thing at the, uh, at, the, at the graveside service. Sometimes somebody else may pray. Somebody else may, uh, uh, may sing. Sometimes during the funeral, somebody else may read the obituary. You want to ask the family, hey, do you want somebody else? Sorry, I just now added that, but I just thought of it. It's important. Okay, so we're at the graveside service. We've got to have some songs. We have no live musicians. You don't sing. You don't play the guitar. I barely do. And that's why today we have technology and the funeral director can usually bring out a Bluetooth speaker and play songs from their smartphone to that speaker during the graveside service. So you may want to ask that or you may want to borrow a Bluetooth speaker from somebody, ask the family about some songs to play out there, Amazing Grace, I'll Fly Away, Victory in Jesus, Precious Memories, whatever and you can have it on that Bluetooth and play it and put it as a part. You need to have an order of service for the graveside just like you do everything else. Because if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. So at the, after the graveside service is over with, you do the same thing. You close in prayer and then you say, at this time I'm going to turn the service over to Roller McNutt Funeral Home. These guys, they've, they've done a great job. Smith family, whoever it is, and they come up, and then after they say what they're going to say, open the casket back up or whatever, that's when I usually take my, take my crochet, uh, not crochet, uh, uh, whatever the, the, the thing is, on the flower, and I, I take it off and I set it on the casket. And then I go to the people in the front row, which is usually the immediate family, and I shake their hand, hug their neck, and tell them thank you so much for, uh, for allowing me this opportunity. It was an honor and privilege to officiate this funeral. And at the conclusion of the, the funeral, you usually have somebody that slips you uh, 50, $100, gives you a card with a check in it, whatever, and you wanna uh, write a thank you note for to them for that. Say thank you so much. It should you might even want to have one ready there with you. But uh, with me, I'm not allowed to accept any money. So if somebody gives me money, I say you know what I forgot to tell you, but I'm not allowed to accept any money because I'm doing this for hospice. Okay, I'm sorry I, I mentioned the bonus part. What to do if you're just asked to speak at a funeral, to say a few words, to say something, and that's really simple. All you've got to do is tell a personal story about that person and your relationship to them. Just like I mentioned with the person that officiates the funeral, the way that you met them, the impact that they had on your life, maybe a funny story. I'm back for just a minute. I thought of something. Also, if you get nervous and and, and for speaking in front of people, you stutter, you're afraid you'll mess up. All you've got to do is verbatim write down or type out what you want to say and stand up there and read it. I've, I've, I've witnessed people do that a lot of times and it turns out great. Maybe a funny story. And then also 
to go right along with that you can read psalm 23 or quote psalm 23 you can read footsteps in the sand you can say a prayer whatever it, it's just something that's special to you that everyone else can relate with that that person that's in the urn or in the casket would be proud to hear you say but one of the main things is to try not to make it just too extremely long. Figure out exactly what you're going to say and condense it down to the main powerful points because nobody wants to hear you get up there and just ramble on for such a long time, okay? I, I know I don't mean to be rude about that, but that's the truth. Some people uh, sit, ha, take a time they get nervous and they just ramble on and on but have it written down exactly what you're going to say in bullet points go over that and honor that person and honor God one thing that you never ever ever want to do in a funeral service is preach the person into heaven. Maybe it's a close friend or relative and you know that they were a Christian and they lived a dedicated life and that's fine to say that we can see them again someday, but too many times people are tempted to comfort the family by saying that this person that they may not know very much about is in heaven and that gives a wrong impression to people. Well, okay, that's it, folks. If you've got any recommendations, any tips, anything that I could change in my funeral service, leave it down below. And I'm going to tell you, this is the form that I go through, but if I was preaching somebody's funeral like a close family member or something, it, it probably wouldn't be this way. It, it, and you always need to be led of the Lord to, to bring something out. And I don't always go by this. I may feel something else completely different. This may be a little bit long, but most of the times when it's just me, when it's just me, my part of the funeral service is usually about 30 minutes with the songs and, and everything. That's it. And I tell the family that. I say what I've got to do, what I've got to say usually takes about 30 minutes. Anything else is added on to that. That's why if you have a funeral where it's really long, you've usually got multiple people coming up and saying things. But with this, what I've got right here is usually around 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes at, at the max. So you need to bring that out and let them know that. And I hope this has helped you. If you got any questions, let me know. And if you would like a, if, hey Mace, and if you would like for me to take pictures of this outline right here, I wish I could say I'd type it up and send it to you, but I probably won't have time to do that. But if you would like for me to take pictures of it, everything that I've got on here and send it to you, you can copy it down or, or you can go to Walmart and have it printed out and put it in your Bible so you've always got it. You, you never know when you're going to need it. I would, I would love to help you with that. Praying for you, God help these people that may have to officiate the funeral funerals because they're very important. And this is Chaplain Reese signing off. Don't forget to read your Bible and pray every day. Don't forget I love you and appreciate you and I'll see you in the next video. Alright, um, all right, one of, the, one of the most important things that I have to do is I have to take my funeral sermon and I have to put it back in here because if I don't, I'll get asked to preach a funeral and I won't know where that is. So I've got to put it back in there. And I've, I've also got the, the stages of grief and a few other things in here. So I got that.